Good morning. How's everybody doing? Staying warm out there? I'm excited we're uh, continuing on in our series in the book of Matthew. And uh, it's been quite an investment for us as a church. We don't usually camp out, maybe in the summer months, we kind of camp out in a book of the Bible, but usually we, we we're known for more four, six week ser- uh, sermon series. But this has been several months walking through the book of Matthew. It's been quite an investment. I hope that you have seen uh, a return on that investment for your own life. I know I have. I've seen the Lord work through the, the sermons we covered, the time that we've spent together. And it's been, it's been really great uh, to have that experience uh, together. So I hope that you've seen a return on that investment. Because when you put time and energy and resources into something, you want to see it come good, right? When you invest your money into stocks or 401k or whatever, you want to see it grow. You want to see a return on that investment. When you put in time and energy at the gym, trying to shed those last few pounds, you want to see them fall away, but they won't because your metabolism hates you. When you put time into a hobby, you want to get better at your hobby. Some of us will not because golf's really not your game and you just need to let that go. I think it's one of the reasons why when our kids grow up or make choices that either disappoint us or we just would say, I don't know that I would have done that. We get, we find ourselves getting a lot more frustrated than we probably could. It's not just because we love them, we do but we're invested and we wanna see return on it. And then we come to our faith in Christ. Your faith in Christ is an investment. You were giving this man who lived 2000 years ago who claimed to be God, you were giving him everything you have and you're saying, make something of it. I'm calling you Lord, I'm calling you Savior. Do something with me, do something with my life take this investment. So what I want us to talk about today as we look at Matthew chapter 8 verses 5 through 13 is how do we have a faith that's worth investing in? How do we have a faith that's worth investing in? I want us to see three things. Faith is humble, it's valuable, and it's powerful. So let's talk about faith has humble beginnings. Faith has humble beginnings. Verse 5 of chapter 8 And when he entered Capernaum, that's Jesus, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Jesus heads back to Capernaum, which is his base of operations, and he just finished preaching the Sermon on the Mount. So he's returned back to his base of operations, and this is a regionally important city. It's so important that it has a centurion stationed there. A centurion would have been charged of about 100 soldiers. They would have reported to him And he probably wasn't a Roman citizen himself. He probably was drawn from one of the Gentile populations surrounding the area. Maybe he was Syrophoenician, like the woman we read about last week. And maybe this guy would have been in charge of a local official sort of bodyguard. Regardless, he would have been, had some power. He would have had some influence. And it says that he draws near. Now in the Luke version of the story, he does, he's not actually there physically. He sends people on his behalf. And I think Luke tells that story that way to emphasize the authority portion of it. Matthew tells the story with the, with the centurion actually there. And I think that's to emphasize the humility of the, of the centurion. So I imagine the centurion drawing near to Jesus. And as he gets closer, the crowd kind of parting. Because when the, one of the leaders of the oppressing army comes through, you move out of the way. Or he will make you move. And so he draws near to Jesus. This guy's a big deal. But he's maybe not as big a deal as you would think. 
Because when it comes down to it, this guy's essentially in middle management. And if you've ever been in middle management, or you are currently in middle management, you know that it's a little bit of a Jekyll and Hyde position to be in. When you're around your superiors, you're rather differential. You laugh at jokes that really are not that funny. You smile, you nod, you agree when appropriate, you push back when you feel like you can, but ultimately you're under their authority and you do what they tell you to do. But then you get around your subordinates and all of a sudden you're surrounded by people that laugh at all of your jokes, curiously enough. And sometimes when you're in this position, you can feel insecure. And you can kind of be a tyrant around people that are beneath you. And you can become a yes man or a yes woman around people that are above you. But that's not what happens to this man. This man is a humble man. We find out from the Luke version of the story that he built a synagogue for the Jews. He put forth his own money for the people that he's supposed to be ruling over. He tells Jesus, a Jewish person, he tells him Lord, which would not have been done. A Roman soldier would never have called somebody who was a Jew Lord. They look down on them. He's even appealing on behalf of his own servant. His servants, the people underneath him, are not throwaway, cast off people. They're important to him. But what evidences his humility more than anything else is his interaction with Jesus. He comes to Jesus. He doesn't ask for anything. He just makes a statement. He says, Lord, my servant is paralyzed and suffering terribly. Now, in many of your translations, Jesus' response is, I will come and heal him. And I don't like to override people's translations. I want you to know that the people who translate your Bible from Greek and from Hebrew are very, very smart and very capable. But in this particular case, the commentary I read had a convincing argument that I will come and heal him is probably not the best reading. The way that the personal pronoun for, for Greek, in Greek for I, which is ego or ego, right, is shoved well forward in the sentence. And it almost reads like this, and you want me to come and heal him. Jesus is like, are you serious? And it's not because Jesus thinks it's not worth his time, it's because he's a Jew and the centurion is a Gentile. He's essentially saying, man, you know the rules, dude. You know I'm not allowed under your roof or I'll become unclean. You know I don't go, I'm a, I'm a practicing Jew, I don't go to Gentiles' homes. And if you read the Gospel of Matthew carefully, Jesus never does enter into the home of a Gentile, ever. And the man has an interesting response. He says, just speak it, because I understand how real authority works. And he says this because he says, I have people under my authority, and I'm under other people's authority. I'm a part of a hierarchy. And that authority does not stop when I'm out of their presence. You see, real authority extends beyond eyesight. That's why he says, when I send a servant and I say, go, he goes. And when I send another one to come and they come and they do this and they do this, I don't have to keep an eye on the people. When they leave my presence, if they're under orders, they're going to do what I tell them to do. Because that's how real authority works. If you tell people to do something and you have to watch them to make sure that they do it, you're not really in charge. And he says, you're under authority. You're a person of authority, just like I am. All you have to do is say it, and it'll happen. If you have the kind of authority that I think you have, it doesn't matter if you're there or you're here, because authority does not recognize distance. This man is under the Roman emperor. He is under the Roman emperor, whether he is right next to him or whether he is way out in Podunk, Palestine. It doesn't matter. That authority extends well beyond you see, this is what real humility is. Real humility is not when somebody compliments you and you're like, oh, I don't know about that. I'm not that great. <laughs> and real humility is not calling yourself worthless and degrading yourself in front of other people. Humility is this. It's reality. It is a proper perspective of how things really are. If you are humble, you understand where you are in position to everybody else around you, where you are in history, 
and where you fit in with everybody else. It's a proper perspective of how things really are. If you are humble, you are a realist. And that's what the centurion is. He's humble. He understands that he and Jesus both are part of hierarchical systems of power. His ultimately tops out at the Roman Empire. Jesus tops out at God himself. And this man recognizes that not only is Jesus higher up in his food chain, but the food chain is greater than even his, than the Roman food chain. And he defers to him. This is humility. This is recognizing how things really are. And this is where faith begins. Faith begins with an accurate understanding of how things really are. Because humility will always acknowledge its need and its lack. You see, pride wants to distort reality. It wants to twist it. It wants you to think that your accomplishments and what you're capable of is much greater than it actually is. It wants to diminish the abilities and the capabilities of other people. But worst of all, pride wants you to convince you that your potential is much greater than it actually is. Pride wants you to think you can handle anything that comes down the pipe, that you've prepared adequately, that you've saved enough money, that you've got a security system in place, that you've got a retirement fund, that you've raised your kids well, and they'll make decisions the right way no matter what's going on. You see, pride wants you to think you can handle anything, whether, no matter what that doctor's report says, even to the point where you stand before God, you think you can stand before God on your own merits because you're a good person. Pride wants you convinced. Once you convince that you don't need God's love, but instead what you need from him is his respect. Respect is earned, but love is not. Love is unconditional. And humility reminds us that we need God's love. And you'll never be able to accept it. You'll never be able to embrace it. You'll never be able to fall headfirst into that great love of Jesus Christ that would die for you If you insist on your pride, the only way to stand before God is one humble, not proud. Humble beginnings, that's where faith starts. That's where it starts. If we could travel back in time, go back to 1980 with $1,000, we might invest in a little fruit company called Apple. And if you did that in 1980, if you had the foresight and the wisdom to buy into this man's vision of computers and iPads and iTablets and all sorts of stuff, iPhones, that $1,000 would be $650,000 now. Now, I am not an economist, but that sounds like a good return on investment to me. Now, a lot of you are here right now today and you're looking at your life, your guilt, your shame, your failings, and you think, what is God going to do with that? Or maybe you're a practical person, like this Pharisee, this, or not Pharisee, this centurion. He's a practical man. He understands faith practically, and you think to yourself, I'm a practical person. Faith doesn't really work for me, Travis. Or you think to yourself, no, 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 no. No, I'm too busy, I'm too distracted, too focused to invest in my faith. Do you understand that Jesus wants to take whatever you have and make it into something great? Do you understand he wants to take these humble beginnings that you have and make them into something rich and flourishing and life-giving, not only to you, but to the people around you? Do you understand that? And I know what you wonder. You wonder whether or not an investment like that will pay off. And we'll get into the return on investment part later. But Jesus starts with humble beginnings. He has a habit of starting with people who don't have very much to offer. Look at Abraham. Look at Isaac. Look at Jacob. Look at David. Shoot, look at Jesus. 
I know he's the son of God, but he was also a carpenter from a no-name place. God takes things that are seemingly inconsequential and makes them the most consequential things in the world. That's what he does. The cross is a piece of wood that rotted long ago. And on it died the most significant death in the history of humanity. We talk about it. We're still talking about it. People that don't even believe in it talk about it. Jesus Christ died. The Son of God died so that you might live, so that you might be forgiven, so that your humble beginnings might not stay humble, but that they might become great, that they might become what God always intended you to be. Because he loves you. Are you humble enough to accept that? Or do you still insist on earning your own way? Because if you do, you'll never make it. You'll never make it. Whatever you have, you give it to Jesus. You give it to Jesus, just like you would give a financial analyst or or an economist some, some money and say, invest this. You give it all to Jesus and you say, hey, I trust you with this life. Make it something. Faith has humble beginnings, but it also has valuable rewards. It has valuable rewards. Look at verse 10. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into utter darkness. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus' response today is very similar to the one he made last week to the Syrophoenician woman. He marvels at the faith of this man. And I think one of the reasons why he does this additional step, he makes an additional step of then taking a teaching moment around him. And I I think one of the reasons why he does this is because he's in Capernaum. He's surrounded by a Jewish audience and he wants to make something very clear. The Capernaum's in bad shape spiritually. You see, it's a significant city, economically, politically. The Messiah himself is based out of there. He lives there, okay? That's his residence. We know for a fact that as many as three disciples came from there, maybe as many as five lived there. And yet look at what Jesus says in chapter 11, verse 23. He says, and you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Do you see what Jesus is saying here? He's saying if the miracles that Jesus did in Capernaum, which this is about to be one of them, if it was done in Sodom before Sodom was destroyed, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom would have repented and would have saved itself. That's how off track Capernaum is, that they don't even believe the Messiah when he's in their midst. And this is a warning to them. He's warning them that there are Gentiles. This is what he means by people coming from east and from west, people from Persia and Rome and Egypt. These people are all getting to the kingdom sooner than the people that the kingdom originally started with. The Jews, the Jewish audience. And he describes it this way. He says that it is the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, this is a metaphor for the Messianic kingdom, the Messianic feast. And if you were a Jewish person back in those days, have you ever played that game where if you go to dinner with people, you're like, if you could have dinner with anybody from history, who would you have dinner with? If you were Jewish in the ancient world, you would have started with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you maybe extended that to David and to Moses and to Elijah. And they believed that at the end of all things... There would be this great feast, this banquet with the Messiah, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be throwing the party because their faith was realized. And what Jesus is saying here is, Jewish brothers and sisters, do you understand that the Gentiles are coming to know faith? They're coming to faith sooner and faster and quicker than you are, that they're going to be invited and included in this. And not only are you going to be excluded, you're going to be kicked out because you do not believe. There's a lot of ways to measure what's valuable. 
Sometimes we measure money as valuable because of what it can buy us. Sometimes we measure it for the comfort and security that it can give us, the way it can save us time. But one of the ways we measure value is what kind of access does it give us? What do I get to be involved in exclusively that other people don't get to because of who I am? What country clubs, golf courses, parties, feasts, celebrations do I get to go to because of my status that other people don't? That's how we measure value. If that's the case, faith is one of the most valuable things in the world because it gives you access. It gives you access to the throne of God. It gives you access to the strength of the Holy Spirit. It gives you access to brothers and sisters in Christ, in community. Things like connect groups and small groups you can be a part of through faith. They're not just meetings of people studying a Bible. It's the Spirit of God at work in the lives of other people. This is one of the major reasons why faith is so valuable and a treasure above treasures because it gives you access Faith is the difference between those who get to dine at the Messiah's table and those who are excluded. Grace is offered to us by Jesus, freely given. Faith is the way you lay hold of it. Faith is the way you take him at his word and say, yes, Lord, I believe that what you've done is enough. Thank you for your grace. But some of us presume, like the Jews of Jesus' day, that we're well on our way and we're not. Some of us presume because we've been a Christian for as long as we can remember. You put those words in quote, Christian. Some of us presume because we've been baptized as an infant or baptized when we were little. Maybe walked an aisle at some point. Maybe you're even a moral person. Maybe you even do some Christian things. Maybe you're really generous. But there are people with pasts that would make you and I blush. Liars, cheats, murderers, addicts, rapists who are coming to know Jesus Christ and they are drawing closer to him quicker than you are. And you've been doing this your whole life. And the difference is faith. The difference is trust. The difference is the humility. It's recognizing that the person who has been forgiven for much recognizes there's nothing they can do to balance the scales. Unfortunately for us good people, good people, we think we can balance the scales. You cannot. You cannot. You see, at the foot of the cross, everybody is equal. At the foot of the cross, we're all the same. And if that bothers you, if you disagree with what I'm saying here, guess what? I don't think you really understand grace. I don't think you understand the gospel. I don't think you understand how deep your sin runs and how broken you really are as a person is why you have to continue to invest in your faith. You've got to know what the gospel is. You've got to know what the gospel is. Do you know? Can you articulate what the gospel is? Can you tell somebody what it is? When you wake up in the morning, do you remember the story of the gospel? And does it give you hope and encouragement? When you're despondent, do you turn to the Lord and remember this great story of his death, his burial, his resurrection? Do you hold on to him? Once you know what the gospel is, you have to start working it into every part of your life. One of the few economic terms that I actually know, the investment ideas that I know, is diversification. You're not supposed to put all your money in one thing, right? That's too risky. So you diversify. That's what we have to do with the gospel. You've got to diversify. If the gospel is the capital, you've got to start working it into every part of your life. Sure, it may start with eternal life. It may start with, I want to go to heaven, but it can't stop there. It's got to be a part of your work. It's got to be a part of your home. It's got to be a part of your wake-up routine. It's got to be a part of your go-to-bed routine. It's got to be a part of your grief. It's got to be a part of your joy. Diversify. Take the gospel into every part. And when you think it's reached every part, go back to your, your advisor, the King of Kings and the Lord of the Lords, and say, where else can I put it? Where else can it be a part? Because I know I've missed something. The gospel has to be invested in every part, and when it is, you'll start to see results. You'll start to see powerful results. Let's talk about faith's powerful results. Verse 13, and at the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you as you have believed, and the servant was healed at that very moment. 
This is interesting to me because what happens is Jesus tells the centurion that his servant will be healed according to what he believed. So if the centurion believed that he'd be healed a little, it seems like he'd be healed a little. If he's completely healed, that's what was going to happen. It's all up to the centurion's great faith. Now, a shadier pastor than I would tell you at this point that if you just believe hard enough, you can have those things you want. If you believe hard enough, you can get that job you've always wanted. Or you can get that spouse that's going to make people look at you and be like, what are they doing with them? Or you can get that parking spot next to the shopping cart return. Because that's really what life's all about. Especially in the summer. Don't be one of the, I used to get the carts out of the parking lot. Don't be one of those people who leaves your buggy outside the corral. Just public service announcement, put it up. Just side note, put it up. But you see, with faith, that's not what real faith is. Bailey Ray, one of our residents, is preaching over in the Great Hall right now, and I heard he's doing a great job. He said this this week, faith is believing that Jesus Christ will do the things that he says he will do. That Jesus can do what Jesus says he will do. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus will do what he says he will do? Because he makes a lot of promises. Have you noticed this? He makes a lot of promises. He just did the Sermon on the Mount. These are some of the things that he says. He says that people will see your good works and glorify God. Do you believe that? Do you believe people will see your good and give God glory for it? Do you believe that God will reward the things you do in secret that nobody knows about? Are we so obsessed with people seeing what we do because we lack faith? Do you believe God knows what you need before you ask? Do you believe that God will clothe you because he promised to? Do you believe that God promises to hear you when you pray? Do you believe? Probably the greatest promise Jesus makes to us is in Matthew 28, 20. It's actually the last thing he says. He tells the disciples, I will be with you until the very end of the age. This is the kind of thing, kind of faith the centurion would recognize because I don't see Jesus here. Jesus isn't sitting on the front row evaluating my sermon. Praise the Lord. Jesus is nowhere to be found physically, but he says he'll be with us. We have to go back to our centurion friend. And we have to recognize that authority does not limit itself by distance. Just because we can't see him doesn't mean his power and his presence is not available to us. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is working and is active despite all the stuff that's going on in our world right now? Do you believe it? Despite the the shipwreck maybe that your life is, maybe the shipwreck that your faith is, do you believe that he's still working? Do you believe that your faith will yield powerful results even when it looks like it won't? Because you can look at your life and you can see it if you look hard enough. There's these great things called the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. When you're following Christ, when you've given him your life, those things will grow in your life. Not because you're working on them. Not because you're saying to yourself, I'm going to work on self-control this week. I'm not going to eat all that chocolate. And I'm going to grow this in my life. No. When you trust in Christ, that stuff manifests itself. The more faith you put in him, the more you invest in him, the more you give to him to invest for you. And he's going to complete that work in you. One of the few uh, investment terms that I'm I'm, uh, familiar with, and this will exhaust my knowledge of investment things, so ask nothing else of me, is the blue chip stock. And a blue chip stock is one that, regardless of what the market does, it seems to be a pretty safe place to put your money. Things like Coca-Cola, which is largely kept afloat by my Diet Coke habit. Home Depot, General Electric, things like those are or have been blue chip stocks. We have what we think are blue chip stocks in our lives. Put a lot of faith in our job, in our family, in our plans for the future in our church, put a lot of faith in our health, in our decision-making abilities, but there is only one blue chip stock to put your life in, and it is Jesus Christ. 
He's the only one that won't let you down. He's the only one that won't fail you. He's the only one that won't go away. He's the only one you can trust. So what do you do? You have to stay invested. Don't get out early. Cryptocurrency does, I think it's doing this now. I don't really know. Again, knowledge is exhausted. But I do know that many people, when they got into cryptocurrency, didn't think it was going to go anywhere, and they got out pretty quick, and then it exploded. And they went, man, I got out too early. Don't look at your life. And when the rough things start happening and the, the frustrations mount, the difficulties and the challenges all come up, don't look at your life and, think, and give up on Jesus Christ and then look back on it and say, I got out too early. I gave up too soon. You keep investing. You double down. No matter what your life, no matter what the market of your life looks like, up, down, sideways, shouldn't matter, bear or bull, it doesn't matter. You keep your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You put it all on him. In his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, because he loves you, will you accept that love? And will you put your trust in him? Faith has humble beginnings, has valuable, valuable rewards, has powerful results, but you gotta stay invested. You gotta stay in it. You can't quit. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you are so good to us, Lord, that you have blessed us immensely with your word and with the truth of your gospel, but most of all, Lord God, with your son. I pray that we would not quit, but that we would stay invested and that you would grow our faith, that it would mature over time and the fruit of the Spirit would manifest itself and on that day we might dine at the table with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. May those who are not on that course, may they come to know you today. It's in your name we pray.